So let's talk about colour mixing for watercolour florals and the one colour you really can't mix. If you love painting watercolour flowers, there's a good chance that you want to use most of that rainbow. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you need a lot of paints. Of course, we can mix quite a few of them, but not all of them. So let's talk about colour mixing for watercolour florals and the one colour you really can't mix. Now, I know what you're thinking. There are surely three colours that you can't mix. The primary colours that we learnt about way back when we were kids at school. Red, blue and yellow. The colours that you need to mix all of the other colours. We'll circle back to that in a minute. That wasn't actually the colour I was talking about. The colour I mean is pink. And if you've ever tried to mix a convincing bright sugar pink before, perhaps you know what I'm talking about. Now, when we were learning about those primary colours as kids in school, we also learned that the way you make pink is to add white to red. Now, when we are painting in watercolour, we don't actually have white paint at all. So is that a problem? Of course not. As watercolour painters, we know that we can use the white of the paper and the water in order to bring more white into our paintings. So if we want to make a red into a pink, all we have to do is water it down then. Isn't that how it works? Because the paints are usually transparent. So the thinner you make them, the more of the white paper shows through. And that's very much like mixing white into your colours. So let's see how that works. All right, so let's have a look and see what happens when we attempt to mix a, re a pink out of a pale red. So in my palette, the reds I happen to have uh, are these ones here. Uh, they're not in a particularly sensible order, but this is my warmer red, which happens to be called Scarlet Red and it's by Schmincke, and this is my Alizarin Crimson, which is the cooler red. Um, and we're gonna try both of those. So to make my paint spring to life, all I need is a little spritz of water. And then let's get a nice concentrated um, blob of the Scarlet Red. Oh, isn't that delightful? And then if we use a lot of water, and thin it down, it should turn into pink, shouldn't it? That's the theory. So, more water means their pigments much uh, is spread out a bit further, um, and we're seeing more of the paper through it, and you can see it is becoming this paler pink colour. We'll see how that dries in a minute. Um, but you can see already that it is a nice shade of pink, but it's actually looking a bit kind of peachy, isn't it? It's not that uh, bright fuchsia pink that you might have in mind. So what about if we go for our alizarin crimson? Maybe we're getting the peach just because this is a bit too warm. So if we go with the bluer one, oh, that's a lovely colour too, isn't it? So there's our glorious alizarin crimson. And if we thin that out, we're getting a lovely pink too, but it's, it's a little bit better, but it's still not that vibrant pink that you might see on something like a fuchsia. So they're very pretty, but the problem is when you've got these pale um, paints, the, the more water you have in the paint, it's going to behave a little bit differently. So if you're wanting an intense pop of a pale pink colour, you're going to have a bit of a challenge working like this. But um, our main issue is that we don't have uh, that bright, vibrant pink that we were after. So let me compare those pinks to the pinks that I have bought. So the, the bright fuchsia pink that I'm talking about is something a bit more like this. 
Now that's actually called Brilliant Purple by Schmincke and it's reasonably similar to the one that Daniel Smith makes which is called Opera Pink. It's not quite as purpley as that. Um, and that is this glorious vibrant colour and I do love it. You know that you see there when I show you those two together you, you start getting the idea of that really vibrant pink as opposed to these more muted kind of uh, soft corally colours over here. Um, I also have, because you maybe you want more of a, a pink and not so much of that bright colour, uh, so I bought a colour called Rose Madder. And this one, I'm going to pop it here, this is my kind of standard pink, and I have to say it's very similar to the Alizarin Crimson there. So I'm not sure that I actually needed that. But again, it does help me where I've got that situation where I want um, a nice thick paint, so less water, uh, but I still want the pale pink colour. So if I, if that's the case, it's I'm going to have to have my Rose Madder rather than a dilute Alizarin Crimson. The other one I've got um, is called Brilliant Pink by Holbein. Not sure that's what I would call brilliant, but you'll see that's more of a baby pink. I um, wonder if you can see that nicely on the camera there. Now this one, I, if I'm honest, don't like it much at all and I don't use it very often because it's actually not a transparent paint. It's got white added to it, uh, white gouache in there. So I don't like that particularly much, but I, I do use it occasionally. Um, so those are the pinks in my palette, but the, the, the properly pink, pink one is that really vibrant one. And I want to show you something that really uh, blew my mind a little bit, if I'm honest, because I had really just accepted the story about uh, you can't mix primary colours, uh, and so that red, blue and yellow you just had to buy. But I want to show you this. So this is my really vibrant pink. Gosh, it's quite glorious, isn't it? You see there. And so if I take that pink and I'm going to go for another one of my absolute favourites, Quinacridone Gold. I want to mix those two together and I've got to try and get them in a fairly equal concentration for you. Now, look at that. That, my friends, is red. Isn't that amazing? Who said you can't mix red? You can. Let me show you that. That is absolutely red. Uh, and I've got, it does dry a little bit differently and I've got a, another swatch I was playing with, let me show you. This was another swatch I was playing with earlier and that is the same dried mixture. And so you can see it is absolutely, totally red. So if we know that red is actually made up of this pink and yellow, it's starting to make a bit more sense why our um, reds when we dilute them a bit suddenly don't seem quite as red because now we know that they've got a little bit of that yellow already in them. Okay so now that we know that the red isn't really a true primary if we take the definition of a primary as being a colour that you can't mix. The next question is whether this colour wheel is any good to us at all. Do we need to throw it all out? Uh, because the whole thing doesn't seem to be making so much sense anymore. And as amazing as this was when, it, when I first mixed that and found that that was bright red, when you think about the ink when you change the colours in your printer, it starts to make a bit more sense because the colours in the printer aren't red, blue and yellow. The inks in the printer are cyan, magenta, yellow and black. And from those colours, you can mix all of the colours. And that's really what we've proved here, that you actually need this magenta colour to be able to make red. Uh, and it's got another important implication for us flower painters, which I'm gonna get to in a minute. So the thing is, this colour wheel has served us quite well, and it still does. It's one of these painting tools that is here to make your life easier. 
It's not a perfect system, as we've seen, but it's still very useful. You know, if you are um, having a look for a particular color scheme and you're looking for colors that sit next to each other or for a harmonious uh, color palette, it's a very handy reference to have. If you're looking for a complementary color to give you a more lively painting, this is, again, a useful tool. And if you're wondering about that, I've got another video about it. I will pop a, uh, a link up there in the, uh, in the cards in the top right if you want to see that video about complementary colors. But one of the other things that's important about complementary colors is sometimes when we've got this, a vibrant color and we want to desaturate it, so make it not quite as vibrant, make it a little bit more gray, what we do is we add a little bit of its opposite. And this is what I had started to uh, allude to when I was mentioning uh, this, the implications of what we've discovered about the all-important magenta. So let's give ourselves a new sheet of paper here. If you've ever tried to mix purple, you would have probably quite logically started with the formula you learnt in primary school of adding red and blue. And when that happens, you do get a very muted purple. Shall we have a go? So if we took uh, let's say uh, scarlet and we added our ultramarine blue which for me is over here that's definitely a purple I've made it a very blue purple so let's put in a bit more red so it's a lovely purpley color that's for sure, but it's very grey, it's very muted, and perhaps you want a nice deep mulberry, and that is marvellous. But maybe you've been a little bit disappointed because you were hoping for a proper bright purple. This is the reason why. We now know that red has got a little bit of yellow in it. So what we've really done when we've made this mixture is that we've added the red colour, which contains a bit of yellow, and the blue. So now we have all three of our red, blue and yellow, and we know that those do tend to make a very grey colour. So instead, let's have a go at mixing a purple using something like my bright, lovely magenta color. And I'm just opting for something like this blue here, which for me, that's manganese blue. And that's giving me a lovely bright purple, uh, not quite as gray as the one above. Uh, and obviously we can keep playing with that and make it a bit more interesting. But the point is, when we use those, that combination, let's try it with the ultramarine, shall we? Um, because we've got, we don't have the yellow messing everything up, which we now know was hiding in the red, we're going to get less of the graying effect. So let's put a bit of ultramarine blue See, there's a much more proper, true purple. If you compare that one, which was the scarlet plus ultramarine blue, this one is the magenta plus ultramarine blue, and it's looking a lot more like a purple. I'll put some of my um, pre-mixed purple, so the purple that I bought. This is a dioxazine violet. See, that's much more like that. Yes, so that clarifies the, the uh, mystery of the muted purples, if that was something that has been troubling you. And I know that pink and purple are two of the most uh, important colors for me when it comes to painting flowers. So hopefully you found this a little bit helpful. I don't think there's any need to throw away your uh, color wheel. All of these things are tools, you just use them if they're helping you, ignore it if it isn't, and most of all, have a lot of fun playing with this rainbow of colours while you paint your glorious watercolour flowers.